Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to today's session. Today's session will be discussing urinary tract infections. We will be covering this particular topic under the headings of definition, clinical presentation and risk factor, pathogenesis, management and prevention and I will be discussing the workup of a case of urinary tract infections and telling you in brief about the important pathogens which cause urinary tract infections. What is the urinary tract infection? A urinary tract infection is a symptomatic infection of any part of the urinary tract. It could involve the kidney ureters, bladder or urethra and is generally associated with localized inflammation of the affected part. It can present with lower urinary tract symptoms presenting clinically as cystitis, urethritis or prostatitis or it can present with upper urinary tract infection like pyelonephritis and pyelitis. Now, this will be the third most common infection you will see in your medical clinics. It will be preceded only by respiratory infections and gastrointestinal infections. It is responsible for almost 10 million visits to medical clinics and hospitals each year. About 40 percent of women and 12 percent of men have a urinary tract infection at some stage of their lives. So, you can realize how important it is for you to know about urinary tract infections. A urinary tract infection presents with symptoms of pain during micturation which is called dysuria, frequent urination or frequency, feeling the need to urinate despite having an empty bladder and urgency and fever. These are the symptoms of lower urinary tract infection. In upper urinary tract infection, all of the above will be present along with fever and dry gas and flank pain. The two infections can be differentiated in the laboratory as antibody coated bacteria can be detected in urine by immunofluorescence using fluorescent tagged anti human globulins. This will occur only in upper urinary tract infection because as the bacteria are passing through the kidneys, they will get coated with antibodies to the bacteria and they can be detected. In lower urinary tract infection, these antibody coated bacteria cannot be detected. The risk factors associated with urinary tract are age, extremes of age are involved especially postmenopausal women because of deficiency of hormones, sex, the female sex is more prone to infection, in immunocompromised states like diabetes, HIV, AIDS and pregnancy, there are the more chances of getting a urinary tract infection. Indwelling catheters or urinary tract instrumentation also makes the patient more prone to urinary tract infection, obstructive uropathies, example benign enlargement of the prostate, stones are also conducive for in infection. Urinary incontinence and neurogenic bladders are other factors which may contribute to the occurrence of a urinary tract infection. When you diagnose that this patient has a urinary tract infection, he must have enough bacteria in the urine. The urine in the bladder is sterile, but as it passes through the urethra, it collects a few organisms present on from the surface of the skin and the urine is voided. So, in a voided urine, there will always be a few bacteria. So, CAS in 1957 defined criteria to differentiate between contamination of urine by urethral microorganisms and urinary tract infection. His criteria stated that the presence of more than 10 to the power of 5 organisms per ml of freshly voided urine indicates urinary tract infection. For urine collected via bladder catheterization, the threshold is 100 colony forming units or 100 bacteria per ml of urine. The threshold is also 100 bacteria per ml of urine for women displaying UTI urinary tract infection symptoms. So, in a symptomatic patient, a count less than 10 to the power of 5 organisms per ml should be accepted as urinary tract infection. Counts less than that can be significant even in the presence of urinary tract infection. If the patient is on antibiotics, there is some obstruction to the urinary tract, pyelonephritis is present, specimen is collected by a suprapubic aspiration because chances of urethral contamination de decrease here and a fungal infection is present, the same criteria do not apply. Certain terminologies which are used whenever we are discussing urinary tract infection is, one is asymptomatic bacteriuria. Now, the patient has got bacteria in the urine which are detected by culture, but the patient gives no symptoms at all of urinary tract infection. So, that is bacteria and urine in the absence of symptoms, it should be treated only if there are more than 10 to the power of 5 organisms per ml 
on two voided consecutive sample residents in women because women have a chance of greater contamination. If they are more than 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units per ml in one clean catch urine specimen in men it should also be treated and more than 10 to the power of 2 colony forming units per ml in a catheterized urine specimen the patient needs to be treated for even asymptomatic bacteriuria. Eurosepsis is defined as septicemia developing secondary to an infection in the urinary tract resulting in systemic inflammatory response of SIRS. Uncomplicated urinary tract infection UTI without any underlying disease such as renal disease or neurological disease is referred to as uncomplicated UTI and this is what we more commonly see. Complicated UTI is UTI with structural medical or neurological disease which could be either even a benign prost uh, enlargement of the prostate or stones in the bladder. Recurrent disease could be if there are more than 3 symptomatic urinary tract infections within 12 months following clinical therapy. So, you treat a one inf a urinary tract infection, the patient comes back with another one in the same year and may come back with the third one in the same year, then the patient has got recurrent urinary tract infections. The common causative organisms, the bacteria which cause urinary tract infections can be clear cut gram negative bacteria, gram positive bacteria and other bacteria organisms such as the chlamydia, urea plasma and Gardnera vaginalis. The gram neg negative bacteria are more common. The commonest pathogen is E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Pseudomonas, Salmonella and Neisseria. The gram positive among them, the Staphylococcus saprophyticus is the commonest though other Staphylococci, Enterococci can cause infection and sometimes Mycobacterium tuberculosis pre can present as renal tuberculosis. Other causative agents apart from bacteria can be fungi, parasites and viruses. This table shows you the common pathogens which can cause urinary tract infection apart from bacteria. The frequency of the infecting bacteria varies amongst the sexes. The, in women, the commonest organism is E. coli followed by Proteus and Klebsiella. In men, the more common organisms are Proteus followed by E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. In catheterized patients, the infection is more commonly associated with hospital acquired pathogens especially Proteus and Pseudomonas which can be associated with any of the above pathogens and is usually multibacterial infection. In catheterized patients the infection is usually polymicrobial with Proteus and Pseudomonas being associated with any of the above pathogens. Pathogens also differ depending on the clinical scenario in which they occur. In acute uncomplicated UTI, Escherichia coli is most common pathogen causing about 80 percent of the UTI. 20 percent of UTI can be caused by other gram negative enteric bacteria such as Proteus and Klebsiella. Gram positive cocci such as Enterococcus faecalis and Staphylococcus saprophyticus can also contribute to this 20 percent of the urinary tract infections. Complicated UTI especially in hospital acquired infections and catheter so associated ut urinary tract infections often referred to as CA UTI or CORTI. The common pathogens here are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Enterobacter which are generally not seen so commonly in acute uncomplicated urinary tract infections. Majority of the bacteria which cause infection in the urinary tract belong to the family Enterobacteriaceae. They are the common pathogens of the urinary tract because they inhabit the intestinal tract and from the intestinal tract they get easy access to the urinary tract. They are all gram negative bacilli, they are aerobes, facultative anaerobes and they grow readily on most common media. They can be recognized by their biochemical reactions which are very characteristic. They all ferment glucose with or without the production of gas. They reduce nitrates to nitrites, they form catalase but do not form oxidase. So, all the major pathogens of the urinary tract belong to this family Enterobacteriaceae. The bacteria get entry into the urinary tract by various routes. It can be an ascending infection through the urethra, it can be a bloodstream infection but due to bacteremia directly going to the kidney, Staphylococcus aureus more commonly enters the kidney through a bloodstream infection. It can be a lymphatogenous spread from the rectal, colonic or periurethral lymphatics or it can be a direct extension from close by organs by pelvic inflammatory disease or a genitourinary fistula. The first two routes that is ascending route and the hematogenous routes are the two more common routes which usually cause urinary tract infections. What are the virulence factors of the bacteria which make them capable of causing infection once they have got into the urinary tract? Now, normally the bladder because of flushing out of the urine does not let the bacteria get a foothold inside the bladder bacteria. So, the most important factor of the bacteria are the fimbria because they help the bacteria get a foothold in the urinary tract. Specifically a P fimbria which is very important for getting this foothold in the uroepithelium, one of the important characters of all uropathogenic bacteria. 
increase in the amount of capsular K antigens specially present in uropathogenic E. coli which help it to evade phagocytosis. The capsular material covers the bacteria and prevents it from getting e easy access to the phagocytes. Siderophores are also an important component of biofilm formation. So, presence of siderophores in the bacteria help it to get a greater foothold by forming a biofilm in the urinary tract. This is specifically very common the biofilm formation in urinary catheters. Hemolysis produced by Escherichia coli act as membrane damage damaging substances and cause kidney damage. Production of urease enzyme by the proteus species increases the pH of the urine and makes it alkaline and this causes pyelonephritis and stone formation. The treatment of uncomplicated cystitis generally empiric therapy which is given is either nitrofurantoin, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, fluoroquinolone such as ciprofloxacillin, norfloxacillin and the beta lactam antibiotics such as ampicillin and amoxicillin. However, after starting with the empiric treatment, the resistance in urinary pathogens is in on the rise. So, urine for culture should always be sent and the therapy should be changed depending on the sensitivity pattern of the isolate you have obtained from that particular patient's urinary sample. How can one prevent a urinary tract infection? Specifically, it is very important the pregnant woman because it can cause an adverse event in the end of pregnancy. So, you must one must screen and treat all pregnant women for asymptomatic bacteriuria. Aseptic insertion and care of urinary catheters when they are being done in the hospital will prevent a major component of catheter associated urinary tract infections. Prophylactic antibiotics to prevent urinary tract infections have a some role. If more than U two UTIs have occurred, specifically in post coital, if all the infections are usually post coital, then post coital antibiotics can be thought of. Daily or thrice weekly antibiotic prophylaxis can be used to prevent urinary tract infections in patients with recurrent UTI. Recurring symptomatic UTI in postmenopausal women can be treated with topical intravaginal estrogens. Now, let us see how such a patient would present to you. A patient, we are discussing a patient who has come to the hospital with symptoms of the urinary tract infection. In the OPD, a 58 year old male presented with burning micturation, frequency of urination and fever. He gave a history of 3 days duration. On examination, the patient was febrile, his pulse was 100 per minute, his blood pressure was 110 by 70 millimeters of mercury, temperature was 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. On systemic examination, no abnormality was detected. On a per rectal examination, there was a mid lobe enlargement of the prostate. So, the patient was advised a USG, the USG showed a post void retention of 300 cc's. Patient was advised norfloxacillin 400 milligrams 12 hourly and urine was advised for microscopy and culture. The patient was instructed to collect a midstream urine sample after retracting the prepuce and cleaning the glands with plain water. No antiseptic or soap should be used because this can affect the culture results. The sample is to be collected in a wide mouth container which is shown here. The container has a label which gives all details of the patient including age, sex and whatever registration number is available with the patient. The midstream sample is usually collected by letting the first flow pass through collecting the middle part and again letting the last flow for pass through into the toilet. Samp uh, in a child sometimes a midstream sample may not be possible to be collected though there are little pouches available which can be placed on the children's perianal area. So, the urine directly comes into the pouches, but often suprapubic aspiration of the urine from the bladder may have to be done. In a catheterized patient the catheter is clamped and the urine aspirated from above the clamp site with the needle and syringe after disinfecting the area. Some catheters have an additional port for collection. Urine from the bag is never to be collected and only catheterization for the purpose of collecting urine for a urine culture is also not recommended. Now, this urine is a good substance for growth of bacteria. So, it should be transported to the laboratory immediately. If delay is expected, the urine must be refrigerated before transport. If more than a 4 hour delay is expected, 1.8 percent boric acid can be added to the urine sample. Now, once the urine has reached the laboratory, the laboratory personnel will look at the microscopic appearance of the urine. In this particular patient, the urine was opaque, there was no obvious blood or parasites. The pH of the urine was 8.2 that is it was alkaline. Microscopic examination showed many pus cells in the uncentrifuged urine, few RBCs and motile bacteria. So, this is an appearance of the uncentrifuged urine of this particular patient with plenty of pus cells, few bacteria and no uh, few, few RBCs. 
the presence of more than 10 pus cells per hypha field indicates urinary tract infection is an indication of pyuria and patient would have urinary tract infection. So, this is the first test which can be put on the urine which can be done on any patient by doing a microscopic examination of the uncentrifuged urine. The gram stain of the urine showed gram negative bacteria. Now, to look for significant bacteria to find out if it was contamination or it was a pathogen, there are some screening tests available by which one can detect whether the patient really has urinary tract infection. None of these tests are foolproof, they all have their little limitations, but in peripheral area where a proper microbiologist is not available, where you can do these at least these screening tests to confirm that the patient has urinary tract infection. The simplest test is the grease nitrite test because the, in the urine the nitrate reducing bacteria reduce nitrates to nitrites and you get the appearance of nitrites in the urine which normally do not occur in urine. So, the grease nitrite test would be positive, but bacteria which do not break down nitrates to nitrites will not give this test positive. Then the catalase test is positive because most bacteria produce a catalase. Again some bacteria which do not produce catalase such as enterococci will not give this test positive. Then a substance called triphenyl tetrazolium chloride or TTC is converted into a red colored substance. So, this test is also positive. A gram stain shows bacteria of at least one, one bacteria per oil immersion field in an uncentrifuged urine would be the simplest test to say this particular patient has urinary tract infection. Then a dip slide culture is very interesting slide method by which these slides are agar coated slides are available. They are dipped into the container in which urine has been collected or they can be kept in front of the flow of the urine. Slides are incubated and next day you look for the colonies and you compare the colonies with standard strips. Now, this particular colonies if they have reached this third level then you know that the bacteria are more than 10 to the power of 5 per ml and this person can be treated as urinary tract infection. The triphenyl tetrazolium test is done in many laboratories where many urine samples are available. So, sometimes they are screened by the TTC test and then only those which are TTC positive are put in for culture. The urine is added to the TTC if infection is present it is due to the respiratory activity of the bacteria the TTC is converted into a red colored substance or red precipitate is produced. So, this is a positive test and this is a negative test. So, this indicates that this patient would have urinary tract infection. Dipsticks are also available which are very commonly used which can be even an at home test where the urine is the dipsticks are just dipped into the urine and if we get and look for the color change if leukocytes are present you will get a color change somewhere from yellow to mauve. This indicates moderate number of pus cells this indicates many pus cells. Then nitrates being reduced to nitrites can be seen by this pink color and the presence of blood in urine can again be seen by the change in color from orange towards green. So, these are available as these little strips and bottles which can be taken and done at the bedside of the patient. So, these are known as the urine dipsticks which can give an indication patient has urinary tract infection or not. Most laboratories do a semi quantitative culture to estimate if the patient has significant bacteriuria. Semi quantitative method which is usually used is using a 4 millimeter diameter loop sample is plated on a clad medium for in a for semi quantitative count. For plating usually a central streak is made and then horizontal streaks are made across the plate. The loop capacity is 0 0.001 ml. So, the number of colonies which you get on the plate are multiplied by 1000 to get the number of bacteria per ml. Usually 100 colonies represents 10 to the power of 5 organisms in 1 ml of urine. This particular patient showed significant bacteria. The picture at the bottom shows the growth of the patient on cleared medium. This is the method by which it was streaked. First a central streak was made and then horizontal streaks were made across the plate. And when the, it was incubated overnight and allowed to grow, the patient had more than 100 colonies in the plate. So, the patient had significant bacteria. More accurate urine counts can be done by quantitative methods. Quantitative methods can be done por by a pore plate method where 10 fold dilutions of the urine are added to a melted medium. It is cooled, incubated and a colony count is done on the next day. In a dilution method, the urine is serially diluted and 0.1 ml is spread on each plate and colonies on the plate are counted and multiplied by the dilution in which they could be counted. This is the way it is done. So, you have this original urine sample which is serially diluted into various tubes, then 0.1 ml of this is taken onto a plate spread by a spreader and whichever plate shows you a number of colonies which you can count, the colonies are multiplied by the dilution and this is the split plate technique which gives you the number of colonies more accurately per ml of medium. However, quantitative techniques are more tedious specifically in a laboratory which is receiving many urine samples. So, they are often left for research. So, for laboratory use the semi quantitative techniques are used. The sample of the patient was also plated onto a blood agar and a McConkey's agar and incubated aerobically at 37 degrees centigrade for 18 hours. 
on McConkie's agar 2 to 4 millimeters non lactose fermented collagenase were seen as seen on this plate. Now, this is very characteristic of, uh, of the certain bacteria such as Proteus and Pseudomonas. In most uh, women, we get Escherichia coli, which gives you lactose fermenter colonies. So, this was a very, co very common method of differentiating enterobacteria into lactose fermenters and non lactose fermenters. The patient's organism was a non lactose fermenter. On blood agar, swarming was seen. So, the bacteria spread in waves across the medium, it is a motile organism which spreads in may waves across the medium. So, you often do not get isolated colonies on blood agar. The or culture itself has a very fishy odor which is very characteristic of proteus and immediately gives you an indication that you are dealing with a proteus infection. The identification of the microorganism was done by making a smear from the colony, staining with gram stain, gram negative rods were obtained 2 to 4 microns in size by 0.2 micron in size. The standard IMVIC reaction was used for identification. The IMVIC stands for indol, methyl red, hoax proscan, citrate. The reaction showed a minus plus minus plus reaction, which indicated that the organism was indol negative, methyl red positive, hoax proscan negative, and citrate positive. IMVIC reactions can be seen in this picture on the left hand side. In the picture, you can see that the indol is negative, indol was done by a paper method, there is no pink line at the bottom of the paper. So, the paper was negative. The H2S was seen on the TSI, the TSI shows a black color which indicates that the organism is produced H2S. The methyl red is positive, citrate and urease are positive. Now, urease is very very important because characteristic of protease that it gives you urease within 2 to 4 hours. Sugars, glucose and mannitol were fermented with production of acid and gas. So, this is the typical imbic reactions of Proteus mirabilis. So, the organism was identified as Proteus mirabilis and reported as Proteus mirabilis sensitive to ampicillin, ceftriaxone and gentamicin. The patient was put on amoxicillin clavulinic acid 8 hourly for 10 days. He responded and the urinary tract infection subsided. He was advised a prostatectomy to prevent recurrent episodes of urinary tract infection. The organism infecting this patient that is Proteus mirabilis belongs to Enterobacteriaceae triprotea. Now, in this particular group organisms are all non lactose fermenters, they are also intestinal commensals and opportunistic pathogens. It is divided into three genera Proteus, Morganella and Providentia, all three of them are pathogenic organisms. In Proteus, the two species are Proteus mirabilis and Proteus vulgaris. This particular patient had a Proteus mirabilis infection, urinary tract infections can also be caused by Morganella morganellis and some species of Providentia. Other infections caused by the Proteus group of organisms are burn wound other biogenic infections and septicemia. Other organisms which cause urinary tract infections are E. coli which is a lactose fermenter. You can see the pink colored colonies on McConkie's medium in this particular photograph. It is differentiated from the non lactose fermenter colony we got earlier in this patient which was because of Proteus. So, E. coli is the most common organism which is obtained from urinary tract infections, commonest causative agent of urinary tract infection in women. The uropathogenic E. coli are the serotypes which are the earlier serotypes that is O1, O2, O4, O6, O7 etcetera which are the ones which inhabit the intestinal tract and cause urinary tract infections. Diarrhea is usually caused by the later pathogens, the later O types and we have already seen this in the diarrheal infections where we have studied E. coli in detail. Klebsiella pneumoniae is the second most common flora of the intestine, so it also causes urinary tract infections. Three common species are seen, Klebsiella pneumoniae. Klebsiella ozone and Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. Klebsiella pneumoniae is the only uropathogen. Klebsiella ozone generally causes atrophic rhinitis and Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis causes a rhinoscleroma of the nose. Klebsiella itself is a non-motile short capsulated rod 1 to 2 micron in size by 0.5 to 1 micron. The picture on the right shows colonies of Klebsiella on McConkie's medium. They are a characteristically lactose fermenter pink colonies and they are very mucoid. It almost looks like mucus is flowing on the plate. This is very characteristic of a Klebsiella infection and differentiates it from the E. coli colonies where you do not get mucoid colonies, but you get lactose fermenter colonies. The imbic reactions of Klebsiella pneumonia are minus minus plus plus. Indol is negative, H2S is negative, it ferments all sugars with abundant gas, MR is negative, VP is positive, urease and citrate are positive. The picture on the right side is showing indol which is negative, methyl red is also negative citrate is positive, urease is positive and Klebsiella is showing acidification of the butt and the slope. So, it is Klebsiella pneumonia. The diseases caused by Klebsiella are urinary tract infection of the in the hospital specifically catheter associated urinary tract infections which are called as corti. But apart from catheter associated urinary tract infection, the organism was first isolated from pneumonias and 
causes lobar pneumonia in older persons with risk factors such as alcoholism and diabetes mellitus. It can also cause pyogenic infections specifically of the burn wounds and cause septicemia. From the gram positive organisms which cause urinary tract infections, the enterococci are the most common. There are again fecal streptococci, three species of enterococci are common, enterococci fecalis, enterococci fecium and enterococci durans. They are oval cocci present in short chains or arranged at angles to each other. The picture shows the appearance of enterococci present in urine along with pus cells. They can grow in the presence of bile 6.5 percent sodium chloride and at pH of 9.6. They can grow on most of the common media which differentiates it from all the other streptococci which are more fastidious. On sheep blood agar, they can give you non hemolytic tiny colonies which is what you have seen here. So, uh, uh, from the differentiates from other streptococci which are alpha and beta hemolytic, these enterococci are the non hemolytic streptococci. Then on telluride blood agar, they give you black colored colonies. This particular organism is one streptococci which can also grow on McConkie's medium giving you tiny magenta pink colonies. Enterococcus fecalis is the commonest enterococci isolated from clinical samples. It is identified by its ability to ferment mannitol, sucrose, sorbitol and esculin. It causes urinary tract infection, endocarditis, wound infections and intra-abdominal and abscesses. It is intrinsically resistant to cephalosporins and most beta-lactam antibiotics. Penicillin sensitive strains, the drug of choice is penicillin or an aminoglycoside. Penicillin resistant strain, the drug of choice is vancomycin. However, now there is an emergence of vancomycin resistant strains which are known as VRE and here the drug of choice would be linozolid. So, apart from the enterococci, the staphylococci can also cause urinary tract infections. Specifically, the coagulase negative staphylococci present on the skin because from the skin around the urethra, they travel up along the urethra into the bladder and causing cystitis. So, they are normally present on the skin and periurethral areas that is the staphylococcus saprophyticus. It is a gram positive cocci present in clusters, it is coagulase negative, it is identified from other coagulase negative cocci by the presence of its resistance to novobycin on a disc diffusion test. So, the disc diffusion test is done just as you would do for a sensitivity to other antibiotics and if it is novobycin resistant and it is a coagulase negative staphylococci, you would have to keep staph think of staphylococcus saprophyticus. It is sensitive to most of the common antibiotics except nalidixic acid which is used for urinary tract infections. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an important hospital pathogen. So, it is more commonly associated with catheter associated urinary tract infection or CAUTI. It does not belong to the enterobacteria. It is a gram negative bacilli which also grows on all common medium and whenever you open the plate first thing in the morning after you plate at night you will almost the plate will tell you that I am Pseudomonas aeruginosa like this particular plate because it produces a clear cut green pigment which spreads all over this plate. Though it produces many pigments this green color of the pigment is because of pyocyanin. It is catalase and oxidase positive, it is a non fermenter, it can cause pyogenic infections and septicemia. It is usually multi drug resistant. Pseudomonas infections are very, very difficult to treat, and treatment here must be entirely guided by their antibiotic susceptibility pattern. We will be seeing more of Pseudomonas aeruginosa when we study hospital associated infections. I have used many uh, pictures in my presentation. So, these are the references or the links for most of these pictures. I would like to thank all the authors whose pictures have been used here as teaching material for the students. Many of the enterobacteria have been taken from the bacteriology section of the Department of Microbiology BJ Government Medical College. So, I would like to thank the staff of the bacteriology section of BJ Government Medical College and other people who have contributed to the presentation. So, thank you. We must make sure that we keep our bladders healthy so that we nobody suffers from a urinary tract infection and a patient with urinary tract infection, we should know the right drugs to treat. Start empirical treatment, but change to the right drug once the antibiotic sensitivity pattern is available with you. Thank you.